early as 1928, the communists declared that the racial differences among our people constituted the weakest and most vulnerable point in our social fabric. By constantly probing and straining at this one spot, they calculated that eventually the cloth could be torn apart and that Americans could be divided, weakened, and perhaps even set against each other in open combat. We mustn't kid ourselves into thinking that the communists have placed their agitators only into the black communities. They're working both sides of the street. They want hatred, violence, and bloodshed between the races, and they don't care how they get it or whom they use, even children if necessary. Here is a book that I think ought to be in every home library. It's entitled Color, Communism, and Common Sense by Manning Johnson. He joined the party as a young man because he honestly believed that the communists were trying to improve the conditions of his people. He was a dedicated communist, and eventually he rose to one of the highest ranks. But after many years, he discovered that instead they were merely planning to use his people in a bloody revolution to destroy America. And when he woke up to this, he dropped out of the party and devoted the rest of his life trying to alert his fellow citizens of all races to the true nature of the Communist Party as he knew it to be from the inside. Manning Johnson said, Black rebellion was what Moscow wanted. Bloody racial conflict would split America. During the confusion, demoralization and panic would set in. Then finally the Reds say, Workers stop work. Many of them seize arms by attacking arsenals. Street fights become frequent. Under the leadership of the Communist Party, the workers organize revolutionary committees to be in command of the uprising. Armed workers seize the principal government offices, invade the residences of the president and his cabinet members, arrest them, declare the old regime abolished, establish their own power. Now, here is a piece of vicious communist propaganda that perhaps some of you have seen. It's called The Crusader. It's written by Robert F. Williams one of the organizers of the Revolutionary Action Movement. In this issue of the Crusader, the communists call not only for extensive chaos within the cities, but for putting to the torch every village, every forest, every field, and every barn. The plan is for raging fires from one city to the next. The reason? Well, first, there's the value of sheer destruction. Secondly, it would force us to deploy our defenses and rescue units over the widest possible area. The communists point out that as long as our police and National Guard remain concentrated, they're invincible. But if they can be forced to spread out over the entire city and into the countryside as well, then they can be picked off from ambush one by one. And the third value of massive fire to the communists is psychological. The average American, they say, soft and decadent. When he sees billows of black smoke rising from one horizon to the other, when at night the only light he has to see by is the flickering red from flames leaping into the sky, he'll become paralyzed with fear and panic. He'll run away and hide and do nothing to interfere with the guerrilla bands as they strike at the community's power centers. The Crusader explains how to set up sniper units in crowded metropolitan areas, how to manufacture jumbo Molotov cocktails, the gallon jug size and how to mix the gasoline with certain ingredients to make it burn like napalm. How to pour gasoline into utility manholes in the streets to set fire to the main telephone cables. How to put sulfur tips from matches into air conditioning units and blow up large buildings. How to ignite gas mains and oil storage tanks. It explains how radio-controlled model airplanes can be used to fly explosive charges over heavily guarded fences into gasoline storage areas or munition stockpiles. It even calls for infiltration into the National Guard units, revolutionaries posing as non-militants for the purpose of getting free military training and for gaining access to critical military supplies and heavy weapons. And then, finally, Robert Williams says this. Any all-out minority revolution must create a state of crisis wherein almost all of the male population would be forced to remain in their homes to protect their property and families. The middle class is very large, but it is not accustomed to deprivation and terror. Because of its affluence, it has waxed soft. It has no stomach for massive fire, blood, and violence. The motive force behind its life drive 
is its endless pursuit of prestige, conspicuous consumption, and sensual pleasure. A few years of violent, sporadic, and highly destructive uprisings will set the stage for the grand finale. After the stage is properly set through protracted struggle, America could be brought to her knees in 90 days of highly organized, fierce fighting, sabotage, and massive firestorm. Ladies and gentlemen, the plans and preparations for a communist revolution of force and violence are far advanced. The organization behind these preparations has almost unlimited financial resources, and it provides both training and leadership based upon years of experience in many other countries. Our enemies are deadly serious about their task, and it's nothing short of national suicide for us to continue to ignore their plans and their progress. The violent revolution becomes of primary value to the communists to the extent to which it can be used to condition the masses psychologically to accept the nonviolent revolution, which is offered supposedly as the only alternative. Hoping to avoid further violence and bloodshed, the public is to be pressured into accepting measures that will move the country gradually and legally toward communism, but without calling it that. The strategy of the proletarian revolution calls for the quiet conversion of our government into a communist regime, but under the banner of socialism. Well, what is socialism? All right, let's define it. According to the dictionary, socialism is a political concept based upon the principle of government ownership and control of property, the means of production, and the avenues of commerce. Under socialism, those who run the government, and the communists are confident that in America they eventually will be the ones who do so, those who run the government will know who is to get something and who has to wait, and that represents control over human beings. What has all this to do with the communist revolution in America? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it has everything to do with it because the building of socialism is the communist revolution in America. It represents the process whereby our country can be moved gradually toward communism without the people even being aware of it. No matter what grievance we may have, real or imagined, no matter what national problems we may face, the communists seize upon these as excuses to build socialism. They have one and only one solution for all problems. More government, more government, and then more and more until it's total government. And forgive me for saying it one more time, total government is communism. Mr. Besmianov was born in 1939 in a suburb of Moscow. He was the son of a high-ranking Soviet Army officer. He was educated in the elite schools inside the Soviet Union and became an expert in Indian culture and Indian languages. He had an outstanding career with Novosti, which was the, and still is, I should say, the press arm or the press agency of the Soviet Union. It turns out that this is also a front for the KGB. He escaped to the West in 1970 after becoming totally disgusted with the Soviet system, and he did this at great risk to his life. He certainly is one of the world's outstanding experts on the subject of Soviet propaganda and disinformation and active measures. Well, you spoke several times before about ideological subversion. That is a phrase that uh, I'm afraid some Americans don't fully understand. When uh, the Soviets use the phrase ideological subversion, what do they mean by it? Ideological subversion is, is the slow process which we call either ideological subversion or active measures, activne meropriyatia in the language of, of the KGB, or psychological warfare. What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interests of defending themselves, their families, their community, and their country. It's a great brainwashing uh, process which goes very slow and it's divided in, in four basic stages. Uh, the first one being demoralization. It takes from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. Why that many years? 
because this is the minimum number of years which requires to uh, educate one generation of students in the country of, of, of your enemy, exposed to the ideology of the enemy. In other words, Marxism-Leninism ideology is being pumped into the soft heads of, of, of at least three generations of American students without being challenged or counterbalanced by the basic values of Americanism, American patriotism. The demoralization process in the United States is basically completed already. Uh, for the last 25 years, actually it's overfulfilled because uh, demoralization now reaches such areas where previously not even Comrade Andropov and, and all his experts would, would even dream of such a tremendous success. Most of it is done by Americans to Americans, thanks to lack of moral standards. As I mentioned before, uh, exposure to true information does not matter anymore. A person who was demoralized is unable to assess true information. The facts tell nothing to him. Uh, even if I shower him with information, with, with authentic proof, with documents, with pictures, even if I take him by force to the Soviet Union and show him concentration camp, he will refuse to believe it until he, he is going to receive a kick in, the, in his fat bottom. When a military boot crashes his balls, then he will understand, but not before that. That's the tragic of the situation of demoralization. The next stage is destabilization. This time, subverter does not care about your ideas and the patterns of your consumption. Whether you eat junk food and get fat and flabby, it doesn't matter anymore. This time, and it takes only from two to five years to destabilize a nation, uh, it's, what, what matters is essentials, economy, foreign relations, defense systems. Uh, and you can see it quite clearly that in some areas, uh, in such sensitive areas as, as uh, defense, an economy, uh, the uh, influence of Marxist-Leninist ideas in the United States is absolutely fantastic. I, I could never believe it 14 years ago when I landed uh, in this part of the world that the process will go that fast. Uh, the next stage, of course, is crisis. It, it, it may take only up to six weeks to, to bring a country to the verge of crisis. You can see it in, in Central America now. And after crisis, with a violent change of, of power, structure, and economy, you have so-called the period of normalization. It may last indefinitely. Normalization is a cynical expression borrowed from Soviet propaganda. When the Soviet tanks moved into Czechoslovakia in 68, Comrade Brezhnev said, now the situation in brotherly Czechoslovakia is normalized. This is what will happen in the United States if you allow all these schmucks to bring the country to crisis to promise people all kind of goodies and the paradise on earth, uh, to, to destabilize your uh, economy, to eliminate the principle of free market competition, and to put a big brother government in Washington, D.C., with uh, benevolent dictators like Walter Mondale, who will promise lots of things, never mind whether the promises are fulfillable or not. Your leftists in the United States, all these professors and all these beautiful civil rights defenders, they are instrumental in the process of the, of the uh, uh, subversion only to destabilize the nation. When their job is completed, they are, non, they are not needed anymore. They know too much. Some of them, when, when they get disillusioned, when they see that Marxist-Lenin has come to power, they, obviously they get offended. They think that they will come to power. That will never happen, of course. They will be lined up against the wall and shot. But they may turn into the most bitter enemies of Marxist-Leninists when they come to power. And that's what happened in Nicaragua. You remember most of these uh, former Marxist-Leninists were either put to prison or one of them split and now he's working against Sandinistas. It happened in, in uh, uh, Grenada when Maurice Bishop was, he was already a Marxist. He was executed by, by a new Marxist, who was more Marxist than this Marxist. Same happened in Afghanistan when uh, first there was Taraki, he was killed by Amin, then Amin was killed by Babra Karman with the help of KGB. Same happened in, in Bangladesh when Mujibur Rahman, very pro-Soviet leftist, was assassinated by his own Marxist-Leninist military comrades. It's the same pattern everywhere. The, the time bomb is ticking with every second.